I would have a very successful school in St. Petersburg, Florida, but my retention rate wasn't that strong and it was frustrating for me. And it finally hit me. In the first half of the class, I would teach the students traditional martial arts, which includes deep stances, the hand back to the hip, holding the punch out, keeping your chin up, squaring your shoulders, having good form, aiming the punch. Who aims a punch? Does anybody aim a punch uh, uh, other than karate guys? Uh, again, shoulders squared off, so your front, you're squared and all that kind of stuff. And I started to realize that I do that in the first half of class. We would start with basics, and then be rising block, and then side block, and then form block, and then knife hand block. And then the simplest of all, reverse advance. That would be the first half of the class, and then we would do our kata. The rank separation was due to kata. If you didn't have more advanced kata, you really don't need advanced classes for upper ranks. It's pretty much the kata that, that causes you to teach more classes than you need to, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So the first half of the class, we're doing all this, aiming the punch out there, pulling the hand back to the hip. In the second half of the class, we're doing target work or sparring. So now what do my commands become? What, what am I teaching now? Keep your feet under you, move around, pull that hand right back, keep that head moving, chin down, chin down, keep those hands up. Well, which is it? Is it this or is it this? I decided it was this. This made a lot more sense. Both in terms of sport martial arts. I was a, my, my brothers and I, according to Joe Lewis and Mike Anderson, the only three sibling world kickboxing championships or champions. So I was very, uh, I get really good at fighting, but I had also been a kata champion. I had more trophies in kata than I did in fighting. In fact, I was a 1984 uh, Korean Forms Champion at the US Open. And then when the WACO, World Association of Kickboxing Organizations, which I think is now going to the Olympics, when they launched, they decided to finally start including a kata division. And this was back in the late 80s. And I flew to Munich, Germany, to organize, help organize that and to teach them how to judge kata. I was the first centered ref for the Waco Kata Championships. So I love kata, I, it's in my blood, but I realized in time when I took a step back and looked at this objectively, it doesn't make sense. And now that we can see the videos of the bunkai from the 1960s in black and white, the Japanese and Okinawan guys doing their fight scenes, it looks like a bad Kung Fu movie. There's nothing in there that has real value. So the contrast was for me, I'm contradicting myself. The first half of the class, that's what you want to do. Get that, you know, second half of the class, get that head moving, moving, moving. So I decided to eliminate all the traditional skills, not eliminate the respect the courtesy, bowing in and out of class. I'm cool with that. That's all fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It is separating myself from the brainwashing of traditional martial arts. Traditional martial arts is all smoke and mirrors. There's nothing behind the smoke and mirrors. And I say that knowing that a lot of you guys are not going to want to hear that, but it's the truth. So when I replace this stuff with this stuff, so instead of doing a kind of like chunji, we would do fighting combinations, jab, side, keep the leg, elbow, weave, clear out with a punch. That would play, students loved it. The classes, I mean, they got stuff. I'm not counting 52 white belts in my adult class one night. And all we could do is knees and elbows because <laughs> they would hit each other if they extended their kicks. That's a good problem to have. And it was wonderful. So that really made a big difference, not only in my life, but in my students' life. We talk a lot about how martial arts teaches confidence, right? Yes, 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 yes. What instills confidence? Competence, competence. When you get good at something, it makes you feel more competent about it, more competent about yourself. So if I can get the students, how confident do these new students feel doing this stuff? I mean, in my first class, I used to teach, this was a defense against a front kick to the groin. Cross your arms, turn your body, step forward, and block. <laughs> I 
then all these steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then aim your punch and step forward and punch. Then the guy runs home to his wife. Honey, look what I learned. Kick me in the groin. <laughs> it's insanity. You cannot believe that that's actual fighting. And when the students would ask me, why are we crossing our arms? It's for power. Hmm. Why does a block require power? Well, because I'm, I'm blocking, I'm going to injure that guy and break his arm with my block. You're going to block my jab with a, your, your cross, this stuff? You're going to stop my haymaker? You're going to stop my kick? I don't think so. I think you'll give as far as this, and you're going to get knocked out. So I want to demonstrate to you a first lesson in empowered kickboxing. And this is not etched in stone at all. You do what you want to do if you're in power kickboxing. It's just plenty of freedom there. But this is what I would teach in my first class. And we still come to June B, the Korean position, except we call it ready. Ready. Everybody's ready. Eyes straight ahead. They're wearing gi pants, a belt, and a school t-shirt. No gi tops. No outdoor pajamas. They get in the way and they're ugly. So here we go. First position we're going to learn is called fighting stance or guarding stance. First thing we do is we lower our center of gravity by bending our knees, pull your left foot in, and take a natural step forward. So I'm going to take my left foot and pull it in halfway, and then take a natural step forward. I turn that front foot off just a little bit, and the back foot off goes 45, back foot goes 45, and I'm getting that back heel off the ground. I should be 50-50 right now. So from here, I can bend my left knee and sit to the left. Good. That's called a slip. I don't, I don't want you to do this, but you're gonna use your knee and just slip. And then slip to the back and slip. Now imagine you've got a wire right here and you're gonna go under it. You're gonna go under it. Okay, good. Now, bring your elbows in, pull your hands up so you can touch your temples. This is called your guard. So before I teach you how to strike somebody, let me teach you an important block to protect yourself. The most common attack in street fights on YouTube is the haymaker, the right haymaker. Why are, we, why are we teaching people this first place? <laughs> you can go the part. <laughs> so it's the haymaker. So here's our first block. This is called block number one. It's also known as a shield. Open your hand, raise your shoulder, and hide behind the block. That's it. Ready? Block. 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 Okay, down the other side, same thing. You're gonna you don't want to over-rotate, but you're gonna tuck your and hide behind this hand right here. So this is one and this is two. Ready? Two, two, two. Good. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Three and four are like little window wipers. This is against a straight punch to your face. You just kind of wipe it away. So I don't reach to block. I don't want to go out to the opponent. I want to protect my target. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Five and six, center line. I'm just going to take that elbow and bring it to the center and back. Elbow to the center, five, six, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven and eight are against low kicks. I'm gonna raise that knee to my elbow. So they touch right there. So it creates a shield, or I can do the same thing this way, this way. So seven, eight, and finally, nine and 10. Here comes the kick to the groin. There's your nine and 10. That's your downward block. Notice from the side, I'm not reaching out, keeping it in close. So if it doesn't reach me, I don't have to make contact with it. I don't wanna reach for the weapon ever. So I block and come right back. So nine, and then the other side, 10. 10. So let's go through them all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, two. That was wrong. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There you go. <laughs> I had brain set up. So those are the 10 blocks in a power kickboxing. There'll never be additional blocks. Those are the blocks. That's it. So they're very easy to learn. Now we're gonna learn our first punch, all right? So we'll come back to our position. Again, bend your knees, half step in, take a natural step forward, turn your body to the side so you can protect your center line, elbows in. This is called the front hand jab. Just right now, just take your hand, extend it out and jab, and back. Straight to the target and back. Now this time without punching, push off your back leg and turn your shoulder. Push and turn, push and turn. Good, hands up. Let's put them both together. So watch me. I'm going to push and turn. I'm hiding behind this jab. I'm hiding behind the shoulder and pulling the hand straight back. So it snaps. It's like you take a towel and you snap your body with a wet towel. 
that's what we're doing here. So we don't want to hold it out there. We want it to fire and get right back to guard. Ready? When I say jab, I want to see a jab just like this. Breathe out. Jab, jab, jab. And then we switch sides and the jabs to the other side. That's punch number one. There are four punches in a power kickboxing. These are called the foundational skills. Here's punch number two. Come to your ready position, bend your knees, step halfway in, sit forward, turn your body, elbows in, hands up. Now in this case, imagine you're swinging a baseball bat. So I'm gonna swing a baseball bat or a golf club. So we're gonna just drop our hands and just turn your body and back. And this time as you turn your body, shift your weight to the front leg and freeze. Ready, turn and freeze. Now you should be able to almost lift this back leg up because your weight's to the front. So we're shifting our weight into the punch. All right, now let's put it together with a punch. Watch me first, I'm gonna do that turn, bang. Throw the punch, hide down behind it, and then snap it right back. With me, this is the number two punch. Ready, punch, back, punch, back. Switch sides, and we do the other side. Probably five on each side. The next punch is the number three punch. This is called the hook punch. In this case, instead of turning forward, we're gonna pivot back. I can grab a rope and pulling the rope. So my feet are pivoting, and my weight's going on the back leg. Here are your body lines. You don't want your hand ever to get outside of the body line. So from here, all I want you to do is just turn your hand over. Good, turn your hand over. One more time, turn the hand over. Good, now we'll combine it all together. We're gonna pivot, sit back, and throw our hook. Side view, bang. See, I'm hiding behind the shoulder, keeping this hand up high, hook. And we wanna snap it just like the jab, just like the cross. Boom, steps right back, boom, steps right back. Number four, the fourth punch in the final punch is the uppercut. <clears throat> the uppercut is hard to see coming. It's really effective. I think I'm naturally five foot eight, but my brother Jim and Mark would hit me so many uppercuts when we sparred that I added a couple inches, that's the truth. So this is a devastating punch and it's really, really good for self-defense into the throat as well. So from here, we're gonna bend our knees, go a little under our natural position, turn the body, and then pop up a little bit. Here we go. So from here, we're gonna bend the knees, turn the body, and then just come up. I'm not reaching, it's just a short little punch. I like to get a little bit of legs in there, so we're gonna, I don't wanna go up from my fighting position, I'm just gonna dip a little bit and get back to that same original position. Four punches, one, two, three, four. So when I call the numbers, you, you punch. Ready, one, two, one, two, three, four, three, four, four, three, four, three, four, three, two. Listen to the cadence, four, three, two, four, three. If I come way back here to throw that two. So that's how I call the numbers in the cadence. Four, three, two, four, three, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two, one, one, two. One, two. I would then teach them front kick, and back kick. Here's the deal. What I just did could be done in class with all the students because they're reviewing the basics. The foundation skills are all we ever do in empowered kickboxing. We do front kick, back kick, side kick, round kick, some leg kicks. There are no more additional blocks. There's no such thing as an advanced technique in empowered kickboxing. There are, however, advanced applications. So if Mike Tyson came to your school to teach a class, is he gonna teach a jump spinning secret high ranking hook punch? No, he's gonna teach you head movement, but on a 10th degree black belt level, holy cow. So the, the skills never change. You just create drills that work those skills. So for instance, this is called the touch drill. I don't have anybody with me, but you'll have to pretend. So the students face each other in their guardian stance. And I have them at a distance of about one and a half arm lengths. Not two arm lengths, but about one and a half. So my job is to step in and finger flick that, um, <laughs> I just got it to you. Okay, I'm gonna step in and finger flick the front shoulder. His job is to move back as soon as he sees me coming. So fire, and then the student uses distance as his defense. So you do that for a little bit and then you explain that actually there's a flaw in that drill. What is the flaw? You're waiting for the attack to happen. So we'd rather not be there. So the next part, part two of this drill 
is that me defensively, I'm going to try and move around in good balance to prevent you from getting that front hand jab on my shoulder. All these drills, by the way, are in the Empower Kickboxing lesson plans in class or with partners. I'm just kind of winging it here today. Excuse me. So now in good balance, he's learning to be evasive and moving the target. So we have position movement. And then we go to target movement. So again, the stack was step in, distance control, two, Tar, uh, position movement as a defense. I'm moving my position. And three, target movement. This time you can't move, but you have to move your head. You've got to keep your head moving. You're not going to move in reaction to the punch. You're going to make it so it's hard for him to get. So in both cases, you can use the analogy. you got a BB gun and you're trying to shoot this thing. You wouldn't wait for somebody to pull the trigger and try and get away from the BB gun. You want to move around so they can't get a bead on you. That drill can be done for years in the same class. It is a limited sparring drill. There's a competitive nature about it. So if I just taught those 10 blocks, the four punches, front kick, back kick, to this new kid who's in class with me, I'm 60 years old. I've been doing martial arts for 45 years or so. He's on his second night. He's a white belt. We can do the same drill and both be engaged because I'm going to be thinking about the stuff that I know I need to work on, the little nuances that a master martial artist would have, would deal with. What, what, you know, I, I tend to push my punch or I, I, my hands are a little bit too flaky. This guy's just working on the mechanics. He's just getting it down. So we're in different places in experience, but we're both in the same class and we're both challenged by the class. So that's that is everything. That's the, that's the key. Because now you don't need a green and blue book class and a brown and black book class because of those advanced kata. They're gone. Kids class, adult class, adults and teens, maybe a family class. But you can cut your teaching load down so much with this kind of training because it's easy to teach and it's really easy to learn. I started the conversation with we have to give our students instant value, instant value. None of this, you know, we, and here's the smoke and mirrors of traditional martial arts. How many of y'all have said this to a student? Oh, well, you'll understand more, you get to black belt, right? Well, then they get their black belt and you say, well, that's just the beginning. <laughs> One day you'll be like me. That's an Eastern mindset that I don't subscribe to. <laughs> that's a master student mindset. The East has had the West in a hypnotic trance for decades. Remember, we won the war, just quickly remind you of that. <laughs> so the idea of a student and a master is ingrained in Asian society. So the longer I can keep you as a student by creating complex forms and requirements that'll keep you under my thumb, the more my ego is struck, stroked, and the, the, the longer I remain in that place of power. Now in my book, The Truth About the Martial Arts Business, there's a chapter called The Golden Child. I was a golden child. I bet you were a golden child as well. The golden child is someone who really loves martial arts, takes to it like a moth to light. That was me. I knew from my first class, I was gonna do this forever. And here I am. Why? Why did it appeal to me so much and not somebody else? Why does it look dorky to some people, but I think it's really cool looking at it. It really has a lot to do with our mindset when we joined the school. I came up in a house that was violent. My father, had a, he was a rageaholic. He loved us, but he did not have teaching skills. He was raised on the streets. So his way of communicating was more as code on your face <laughs> uh, or yelling at you and calling call your name. So, I didn't like being at home for one thing. And two, I felt intimidated. I'm just a kid. My dad's six foot sergeant in the army for 20 years. I felt bullied. I felt uh, out of control. That's probably the best way to put it. So then he took us to see this movie called The Five Fingers of Death. And it was the first chop sake karate movie in the United States. It launched the Kung Fu boom, of course, Bruce Lee um, uh, maxed out. 
it was a bad movie. We all knew it was a terrible movie, but the fight scenes were like, we've never seen anything like that before. We were taught to, you know, pull back, let them have it. The John Wayne punch. And, you know, kicking the guy in the groin, that's kind of against the, the rules of a fight. These guys didn't just kick each other in the groin, they pulled their balls out. <laughs> it was, I'd never seen anything like it before. So I had to have that power because in those days, a chop to the neck is all you needed to down somebody. And these days, actually a chop to the neck is all you need to down somebody if you could get that right artery. So anyway, I started calling around to schools. I got invited to watch a class at the Florida Karate Academy, the Florida Karate Academy in Largo, Florida. My dad took us, my brothers and I, and we watched the class. At the beginning of class, this 16 year old blue belt walks to the middle and there's a pole in the center of the class with a pad on it. And he starts to back leg round kick that pole and the whole room shook. Whoa, I, I wanted that. I was, uh, that was it, I was sold. But Hank Farah explained to my dad that classes were $25 a month for 12 months. My dad said, no way, I'm not signing any contracts because he quit football, <laughs> which I did. So a couple months later, Debbie Bone calls me out of the blue, shooting baskets with my brother Jim. And she says, are you still interested in training? I said, I'd love to, but my parents won't pay for it. She said, you sound enthused. Tell you what, you could come clean the dojo for your lessons. I was the original wax on, wax off kid. I was at that dojo the next day and I cleaned, cleaned, cleaned forever and ever. I was so grateful and here I am today. Now think about it, school owners. What if she didn't make that call? Follow-up calls are critical. <laughs> and I know a lot of you, because now that you're a black belt and you're in control all the time, you have a rule inside you that says, I never want to be rejected again. So that process of picking the phone up and asking the questions, trying to get somebody to come into a class, runs the risk of you getting rejected. So those are called conflicting goals. On one hand, I want to enroll more students. So I need to pick the phone up and call them. On the other hand, I've got this internal thing that I didn't want to be rejected again. Those are con conflicting goals and you have a lot of them, we all do. And that's one of them. But she did, if she had not made that call, no NAPMA, no martial arts teachers, no martial arts certification, no martial arts professional, no me standing in front of you right now. For many of you, I'm sure you, you wish you did make the call. So <clears throat> in power kickboxing, the classes always have the same routine, the same structure for the most part. Every year, there are three semesters. Each semester has a one month module, module one, module two, module three, module four. Module one is martial arts. Module two is kickboxing, module three is weapons, and module four is cobra self-defense, bad of bone. So the class structure is this. We start with a quick self-defense tip of the day. It could be a, a, a story, a lecture, a situation awareness, a verbal defense skill, or actually a headlock defense or escape. We do it in the beginning of class because it tends to engage people's minds faster and uh, they don't, they're not all sweaty. So you don't want to do in headlocks with somebody when they're already dripping all over your head. So we get that out of the way. And then we go into a very vigorous 12 to 15 minute warm up, And it incorporates all the foundation skills that I went through earlier. So 30 seconds of jumping jabs. Then I'm going to 30 seconds of jab, step it and jab, clear. Every time, you, every time you jab, step across the line and then clear. Step in and step out. Ready, go. 30 seconds. Uh, jab, jab, jab. Keep those hands up. Move around. Uh, push up. 30 seconds. Back up again. Hook punch. Three punch. Turn that body. Weave. Punch. Weave. Punch. Weave. Go. 30 seconds. Punch. Weave. Punch. Weave. Punch. Weave. There we go. Okay. Back to jumping jacks or, or uh, mountain climbers. 30 seconds. Mountain climbers. Back up again. Okay. Let's put a combination together. Number one block and a counter right hand. One block, counter right hand. Ready, go. 30 seconds. So. They're reviewing the foundation skills quickly as opposed to this stuff, clunky, and they're getting a great workout in. And that's really important, specifically for adults and teens. When they start to feel their body getting stronger quickly, they become addicted to your class. Dopamine really is a very powerful drug in the brain, and it's released when they're exercising. But in a martial arts class, as a beginner, you rarely get that much of a workout because it's all complicated step. You aim in, you're, you're fixing their pinky and, and you're explaining the history of martial arts in Korea 
or who was the 16th emperor of China? Well, <laughs> that is craziness. So again, brainwashing, brainwashing, brainwashing. So these that warm up, and after the warm up, the students are okay. That's when we go into the teaching segment. So in the martial arts module, the teaching segment are the open hand techniques. That's all we do for martial arts is the open hand techniques because they are lethal and they work. So module one is martial arts. Class one, they learn the knife hand. So we'll teach them the knife hand and the knife hand and the knife hand. Then they do it on pads and then they do it on each other. So that's about seven to 10 minute teaching segment. They get their, their, their breath back and they learn. After that, they go to pad work, and then we cool down, life skill, and bow out. That's a 50-minute class. 50 minutes, that gives you 10 minutes between classes to take care of business. So that's module one. Eight classes. On the eighth class, that's when we do our reviews for stripe advancement. So you get a, a, a white stripe or a black stripe, whatever it is. If you have completed the module to the satisfac uh, satisfaction of your instructor, what that means is that we understand that there are four stages of learning. You don't know what you don't know. That's a white belt. You don't know anything about a jab. You don't know anything about head movement. You don't know anything about balance and movement and target movement. You don't know what you don't know. Then you start to know what you don't know, which means you're starting to pick it up and you're moving along. Three is that you become, you're, you're, you're consciously incompetent and then you become consciously competent, which means I can do it, but I got to think about it. And then the black belt level is unconscious competence. You can do it without thinking about it. So we're not too hard on these new students that are just coming through the uh, first semester because they're, it's new to them. So martial arts, class one, they're going to learn the knife hand. Class two will review the knife hand and learn rich hands. The first thing I'm going to knock you by out with was a rich hand. So I love this. And then class three will review knife hand, review rich hand, and then we'll do palm heel or monkey paw, or any other open hand, spear hand. So it stacks, review what you're taught and ta teach something new, review what you're taught, teach something new. The next module is kickboxing. Even though our foundation is in kickboxing, in the module for kickboxing, we use a lot of the Joe Lewis drills. I produced all those DVDs back in the early 2000s, if you recall, and I have all of them. Uh, so we have, great clips of him doing these these drills all come from joe lewis position movement and indirect attack direct attack but you'll have him actually teaching the class so you can you can be joe lewis you can use his exact words because every segment of every class is on a video so you click on it it pops up and you get a quick little video demonstrating how to teach that particular drill or technique so it's very cool it really is great for uh, curriculum consistency so the kickboxing modules, module two, then we go into weapons. And then here we're using the rubber chucks for the kids. So class one, they're gonna learn a single strike, class two, double strike, class three, how to work around the body and all that stuff. So again, stack, 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 stack for eight classes. Last class, they move forward in the strike. The final module is Cobra Defense. Man, oh man, oh man. Am I such a big fan of Chris Sutton and Cobra Defense. I've never, ever seen a better self-defense system. And remember, I brought, I brought Krav Maga to the martial arts world at my convention on Clearwater Beach in 2000, in 1999. I gave them the stage, uh, top of tier as well, Puri from uh, New York. And they, they're the first ones really to demonstrate real self-defense instead of the theory-based stuff that you get in karate class. So Krav was really big. I spent a lot of time with those guys out at their school, I used to watch Boss Rutten teach classes at the school on Olympia Avenue in Los Angeles. But I was sitting with my wife watching my kids in a karate class at Chris Sutton School's school in 2008. He wasn't teaching the class, but then he stepped in to teach a segment of the class, 10 minutes on anti-abduction. It was a lecture. He didn't do it. They didn't do any skills. But I turned to my wife and I said, that is by far the best self-defense lesson I've ever heard. We both enrolled into his 10-week academy, which is two classes a week, two hours, so it's 20 hours. In that academy, I learned more about real self-defense than I did in 45 years of training with the best of the best of the best of the best. So Cobra Defense is a, just light years ahead of anything I've seen. So the fourth module is Cobra Defense. So now we're not going to be doing as much of a warm up 
as we're going to be doing a self-defense academy. We're going to be teaching Cobra's defense, everything from situational awareness to the rules of self-defense, the laws of self-defense. For instance, the bad guy always has an advantage over its victims. What is that advantage? People say surprise, and there's three elements to it. One, time. They choose the time. Two, the place. They choose the place they're going to go after you. And three, they choose the method of attack. So in a domestic, the guy can be sitting there drinking a beer, watching TV with his wife. He thinks she's been cheating. And he's thinking, as soon as I finish this beer, I'm going to smash her face. Time, right after that beer. <laughs> place, right in that couch. Three, method of attack. There it is. Happens every day. Chris Sutton was a, a police officer here. He was a sheriff here. And he was a maximum security guard at a prison here. So he has seen all of this come true. If you're in Walmart at three o'clock in the morning and your car is parked in the, in the, in the uh, corner, that's time, place, method of attack. You put yourself into a bad place. We call it, so then we, we, we take that to the kids and we call it shark infested waters. Let's think about your day today. When are you in shark infested waters? Were you waiting at the bus stop maybe? Maybe on the bus if you don't bus if you don't have a driver that's got a lot of, is, is going to try and control the kids, uh, the PE class at school, before class and after class, if people are kind of milling about in the courtyard, those are all shark infested waters. That's where people get bullied the most. So let's develop some strategies so you can avoid and deal with the shark infested waters. That's great stuff. And we also do in that that fourth module, this covert defense module. Scenarios, scenario training is so effective. For the adults, we'll do ATM robbery uh, scenarios or um, uh, anti-abduction scenarios and demonstrate all kinds of really interesting, exciting. And the program's so strong that you could actually sell it in itself as an eight-week self-defense course. St students would, would come in and pay you maybe $1.99 to take that particular course. And odds are they're gonna stick around because they like your school. So. It, it you know, really creates great traffic, great interest, and again, blows the, <laughs> that bullyproof stuff out of, the, uh, out of the water. By the way, no one is bullyproof. So if you're advertising bullyproof, that's not accurate. Anybody can be bullied. You want to have bully resistant. You want to be anti-bully. You want to be prepared for bullying, but bullying happens whether you like it or not. No one is bullyproof. So we've seen that with presidents, how they get bullied too. Okay, so that's the first lesson with a lot of extra talk. <laughs> Inbound kickboxing is more, it, it is less yak, more smack. That's our slogan, less yak, more smack. Most instructors over explain the techniques and they don't get the kids doing them in a rapid fire me method. Inbound kickboxing is the opposite. Again, we're always trying to create instant value. So how do you deal with a new student that comes into class? You take the whole class through that first lesson and you have the kid right here with you at the front or next to you in the line. No one's gonna say, oh, I don't need to practice these techniques because even if the kid wasn't here and knew, you probably would be doing the same techniques anyway. So there's no secret sauce that you've got to learn before you can come into the class. We bow in, I'm Mr. Graydon, we bow out. Respect and courtesy, you say, Mr. and Mrs., we believe in respect and courtesy. So we want to uh, show that to the world by our example. So though there's their, that's the uh, kind of the mental part of training. And then the physical part is just so easy for everybody to do that they're not concentrating on, you know, the jump spinning reverse punch. They're working on getting those, those techniques down because... If you go to a world-class kickboxing gym, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna learn advanced techniques down the road somewhere? No. You're gonna be doing jab, cross, uppercut, hook on the back, moving around. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here with Empower Kickboxing. So that way a new student can integrate into the class really easily. Now, let me make this clear. I don't teach four to six-year-olds. I never have, <laughs> I never would. I remember the Karate Kid hit and suddenly we were swamped with kids and man, I did not like that at all because you know, there was two parents attached to each kid in those situations. <laughs> that was a very rough teacher, but I digress there. 
So you don't have to concern yourself with in power kickboxing of coming up with a new routine or something because we have hundreds of different drills that you could do, hundreds of different mat scenarios and, and cr uh, uh, criminal scenarios, self-defense scenarios. So the variety is built into the program because every eight classes, the focus changes. And even if you're going around and coming back to mar uh, for instance, martial arts for the second time, students aren't gonna say, oh man, we just did this three months ago. And <laughs> that's not gonna happen. It's gonna be okay, yeah. And they're gonna have more skill because they've done it already. And that's the second time they go through the modules. And by the third time they go through the modules, they get really good at it. So the variety is always there in class because the modules and the focus changes every single month. Empower Kickboxing is a martial art that students can master faster. And I know a lot of people say, oh, let's uh, make a dojo. Call it what you want. It, a traditional martial arts program is by intent padded with an extra long learning curve so that that master can stay master over you for a longer period of time. It's very Eastern. That's not how Americans work. We want it yesterday. We live in a one click world. So certainly there are people that are, and let me make this, I love Kata again. I go back to that again. It's beautiful. I like to watch it, but I don't want to tell people that this is self-defense. It's going to help you in a street fight. It's not, it won't. But as an art form, it's great, like Russian ballet, you know, like watching the old videos of Rushnikov. So it's important to understand that when we're thinking about rank, it's not about time. Joe Lewis earned his first black belt in three months. The instructor made fun of him, tried to make him look like a fool. He picked the instructor up and threw him across the dojo in Okinawa. He went to another school and they gave a black belt in four months. These guys could barely speak English. These guys were the most traditional of traditional of traditional. Three months and four months. Bill Wallace got his black belt in nine months, I think, in Korea, Japan, I don't know where it was. Uh, Mike Stone got his in eight, nine months. So why do we accept it for those guys, but not for ourselves and not for our students? Because they had to learn all this stuff. You know, and I've got video on, make sure you write this down, <laughs> martialartshistorychannel.com, martialartshistorychannel.com. I have video of Joe Lewis as a 19-year-old who just got out of the military, and he's in a park. Black Belt Magazine shot the film in those days, and he was doing his traditional karate forms with a lot of power. You could tell he was really good at it. But then he went to a boxing club in Long Beach, California, Long Beach, California and they pounded him. They played with him. He could not block their punches. This, this, this does not teach you how to block against a barrage of punches. You're gonna do that? You're gonna do that? First, you're gonna put your hand way back because he, you know, he was big and strong. He was a 19 year old Marine. How come he didn't use one of these blocks and break their arms? Because it doesn't work. Smoke and mirrors. So he learned, his first boxing coach was actually Sugar Ray Robinson, but Robinson was starting to get a little bit, uh, I think, dementia, and he couldn't pronounce his words very well. So he started working with a guy named Joey Orbila. Excuse me if I butcher the name. He told me that when he came to the boxing club, the first thing they had him do was six rounds of shadow boxing in the mirror, in the ring, either or. Either or. Every time. So in a sense, that is his cut. They made him do that because he had a hard time getting his hands to come back. When you watch old tournaments, or even today, you'll see a guy do a back fist, and the hand leaves, stays out there and might come back to here. You watch the traditional um, Japanese fighters that are now in the, uh, in the um, Olympics. You know, these, these guys. This is no guard. And when they punch, their hand goes back. They, their face is wide open. Every time you see one of those guys get knocked out, look where their hands are. They're by their waist. And they're blocking with their face. So it was a massive change for him. For me and my brother Jim, the change came when Mike Anderson, you guys oh, hope you remember Mike Anderson. He's the guy that literally created sport martial arts, sport karate. 
He was the first one to require safety gear at a tournament. He was the first one to, he created the PKA back in the old days of the Professional Karate Association, the earliest days of full contact. He had an ABC World Championship on, um, a, sorry, had the World Championship on ABC. It was the biggest rated show of the year in September of 1974. He's a dear friend of mine. I've known him for years. I've got some really cool interviews uh, releasing soon from him. But he had a connection with Angelo Dundee. Angelo Dundee is the, what was the boxing trainer for Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. So he's kind of knows what he's doing. So his right-hand guy was a friend of Mike's. Mike set it up so this guy would come work with my brother Jim and I at the karate school. So he said, okay, guys, show me what you got here. Get in front of yours. Show me some shadow boxing. And we were Taekwondo for him black was you. <laughs> Vertical punch, right? And not because it's Ishin Ru. <laughs> he started laughing. He said, you guys punch like karate guys. And up until that moment, I would think that was a compliment. <laughs> it wasn't a compliment at all. So he was the one that first taught us how to snap your punch and get it back. And let me tell you what, when you start to snap your punch, people fall down. It's amazing because it creates so much velocity on impact, which is a big part of creating power. So that was the big aha moment for me. The second was in 1984, Joe Lewis moved to our area, took me on as his personal training partner, and I learned so much. I've got a video of my, the worst beating he gave me. It's on the martial arts history channel.com that I told you about. He's beating me to death. <laughs> it's the worst pounding I ever had. But when I sparred with him initially, I was a point guy and he was a kickboxer. And it was like, you ever remember as a kid playing with your dad and you can't get a punch in or anything? It just feels like he's so, he's, he's, he's like a turtle. He's, he's completely shut down. That was it. That's what it felt like to me for a long time, but I did get better. <laughs> so this stuff all comes from a real strong base. I did not make any of this up. I, most of it's Joe Lewis. Most of it's uh, boxing training, kickboxing training. I've worked with all kinds of guys. I don't need to go through that. If you go to martialartsteachers.com slash about, or just click on the about, you can see my career timeline. So that is really what I wanted to show you today. And I'm going to post a video of me teaching a traditional first lesson as well. So you can see the contrast between an empower kickboxing first class and this kind of first class. If you have any questions, DM me. I'm sorry, I'm not doing chat right now. I'm here by myself in our conference room. I'm having a blast. This is such a fun way <laughs> to do a meeting, but I need somebody to uh, answer your questions and feed them to me. So there you go. John Gray and empowerkickboxing.com. Also matacertification.com. That is a fantastic instructor certification program that really should be required for every instructor in your school. Earning a black belt does not make you a good teacher. It shows that you know that style, doesn't know that it doesn't, doesn't show that you can communicate how to teach that style. So that's it. I'm John Graydon. Thank you very much. There, I'm bowing out of class and I'm walking to turn the camera on slowly as I'm coming towards you. Here we go. See you guys.